the scripture my dear sister Christina just read says about the report from Jerusalem. Let me give you a little context. Nehemiah is in a place of comfort. He's, he's hanging out in the O.C. by the beach. He's, he's in the, the word she read was Shushan, the summer palace. He, he's at the summer palace of the emperor. He's doing well. Say with me, he's doing well. Yeah, so it's, he's at this summer place. He's at the summer house of your translation says Artaxerxes or Xerxes, the emperor of Persia. He is doing well. Let me tell you what his job is. Let me tell you what his job is. He is the cupbearer. The cupbearer sounds like a great job, but it really just means bodyguard. Because the job of the cupbearer of the emperor was to taste the wine of the king before the king tasted it. You know why he tasted it before the king tasted it? In case anybody was going to assassinate him, if there was poison in the wine or the food taster or the wine bearer would taste it first and the king would just stand there and watch him drink it. And if he didn't fall dead after three minutes, then he would drink the wine. And so he was the secret service of the king. He was, he was in, the, in the summer palace of the king. He was doing well. He's in a place of comfort. But not everybody in his tribe, not everybody in his family, not all of his friends were doing well. And he asked the question that every single Christian who's committed to loving people should ask. How's everybody else doing? And I walked in here this evening and, and, you know, and we had a little time of prayer. And it is really a pastoral question. How's everybody else doing? It, is a, it was a powerful question to ask that the week after midterms. Because some of us graduate summa cum laude. And others magna cum laude. And others cum laude. But a lot of us graduate laud, laud, or help me laud. Is anybody out there? Anybody out there? That organic chem quiz? Oh, Lord have mercy. There are things that will drive you to prayer. Intro to organic chemistry. Hegel and Nietzsche. Intro to philosophy and Hegelian dialectics. They will drive you to pray. And Puerto Ricans preaching at midnight about the Yankees. The reason Nehemiah asked how everybody was doing is because he was genuinely interested. I was talking to Andrew. Andrew, uh, I, I ran into him. He's one of the teams of staff, and I was talking to him. And one of the things I said is, you know, there are a lot of people who love to come to colleges. This is probably the fish, fifth Christian college I came to preach at in the last month and a half. And there are people who love crowds and hate people. So they like to talk to a lot of people. But when it's over, they make a beeline out of there because they like lots of people, but they don't like individual people. And so there is a, a radical distinction between loving crowds and loving people. The crowds loved Jesus. Jesus loved the people in the crowds. And we, we often suffer from this disease of... Lack of empathy. I submit to you, my dear sisters and brothers, mis hermanos y hermanas, les someto a ustedes que lo que nosotros tenemos en esta sociedad es una deficiencia de empatía. I'm not speaking in tongues, it's just Spanish. <laughs> I submit to you that what we have in society is an empathy deficit. And when you have empathy, you are reflecting the character of Jesus. Much of modern and postmodern society, much of late modern society, all it cares about is itself. And so the deeply Christian question that people are looking for us to ask is, how's everybody doing? And so that's what Nehemiah asked one of his brothers, you know, I'm Puerto Rican. Thank, thanks to, to two people like Puerto Ricans. Okay, good. <laughs> and in Puerto Rico, lots of uh, well, let me let me be more honest. I'm a Jersey Rican. Let me tell you what that means. I'm born. I was born in Jersey, in the Jersey Shore, or Jersey, uh, of Puerto Rican parents. So that makes me a Jersey Rican. My wife was born in Brooklyn of Puerto Rican parents, so she's a New Yorican. 
And together, we had two children, one born in New York and one in New Jersey, and they're just confused Ricans. <laughs> what I've discovered, what I'm discovering, because I'm 41 years old, <laughs> is that what much of society is teaching people is how to get ahead at any cost. Look at me. Eso no es el evangelio. Eso no es el evangelio. That is not the gospel. The gospel is always about the other. Paul, the great theologian and the great mind of the New Testament, the great architect of ecclesiology, he says, let this mind be in you. Let this thought process be in you. Let this feeling, let, let this lean be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, humbled himself, took on the form of flesh. In other words, empathy. And let me tell you, I, recently I traveled to Virginia. Anybody see what happened in Virginia? Charlottesville, anybody? News, you saw the riots and, and all of the kind of racial strife. And I, I spoke to some people, African Americans, Latinos, whites, biracial couples, and I asked them if there was one thing that could help us through this, what would it be? And almost to a woman and to a man, they said to me, Pastor, empathy. Empatia. The word pathos means suffering or feeling, or sentiment. Empathy is with. It's like compassion, to suffer with, to feel with. And let, let's be honest, when we're going through stuff, it's hard. Like when I get a D in organic chem, I really don't care about your C in psychology. <laughs> really don't. But the gospel, the gospel, which is the spiritual and moral compass for every person who dares to call himself or herself a follower of Jesus Christ requires of us solidarity. And so Nehemiah, even though he was in the summer palace, chilling in the palace of the king, even though he was okay because he was a man of spiritual depth, he asked, how are my sisters and brothers doing? Recently, I traveled to Puerto Rico. Did I mention I was Puerto Rican? <laughs> I, I live in Florida, and we had just gone through Hurricane Irma. In Houston, they had gone through Hurricane Harvey. In Mexico, a devastating earthquake. In Barbuda, in Cuba, in the Dominican Republic, Hurricane Irma hit. And then, several days later, Hurricane Maria. Here in California, California. California, just rolls off the Puerto Rican tongue, California. <coughs> Wildfires. And it is easy for each of us in our part of the country to be caught up in our own sorrow. But there's something about being in solidarity that is deeply spiritual. Listen to me now. Selfishness is anti-spiritual. Narcissism. I'm not talking about self-care and loving yourself. I'm t you need to love yourself. You need to take care of yourself. I'm talking about selfishness when you only care about yourself. And so the first secret of Nehemiah was to ask, how's everybody doing? Touch your neighbor on his or her shoulder gently and say, how you doing? Or you could do it the friend's way. How you doing? How you doing? ¿Cómo tú estás? ¿Cómo estás? ¿Cómo se va? Añí haseo, calzam hamni da, chimaneo. Don't get it twisted. For she, a lot of people, let's, let's be honest, when you say, when you greet somebody in the hallway or passing by or, or somewhere on campus, when you ask them, Hey, how are you? You really don't want to know. You're like, it's just a, it's just a greeting. But the truth is that in this world where we have an empathy deficit, where we can't see each other, where the 24-hour news cycle turns us against each other, 
where a Republican can't talk to a Democrat and a Democrat can't talk to a Republican and they can't talk to independents. We need somebody who asks somebody else, how are you doing? Whether they believe like you or don't believe like you. Whether they look like you or they don't look like you. Whether they graduate summa cum laude or Lord, Lord, help me, Lord. <laughs> because there's something that ties us together. We are familia. I bet you didn't know you had a Puerto Rican brother that looked this good, but I'm here to tell you you do. <laughs> Just have to affirm myself sometime. <laughs> Empathy is to affirm to yourself and to your fellow man and fellow woman that we are family because every single person in here was created in the imago Dei, in the image and likeness of God. And because of that, I need to worry about how you're doing. There are things in life that distort the image of God. And his brother said, Things are not so hot. The walls of Jerusalem are destroyed and the city is burned down. And the people are downtrodden. There are things that damage us. And so you heard Christina read my biography. She she didn't mention the fun facts. You guys have an issue. I'm serious. Like, Like you got this obsession with fun facts. Like every time I come, I'm like, is there any fun fact? I was like, no, I'm a really boring person. I don't really, I got up this morning, brushed my teeth. So the fun fact I wanted her to share was that I was the first male cheerleader in my high school. Fellow male cheerleader, huh? Okay, I got you. Okay, I'm just leave it right. They leave that right there. Come on. When I signed up to be a male cheerleader at Lakewood High School in Lakewood, New Jersey, a bunch of the football players they tried to make fun of me. They were like, hey, uh, Gabriel. I was like Gabriel, but like Gabriel. <laughs> they were like Gabriel. I was like Gabriel. They were like Gabriel. Like, Gabriel. like Gabe. Just call me Gabe. <laughs> you know. What's your problem? You're a cheerleader. Why don't you try out for the football team and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, let's, let's analyze this. You on Saturdays are behind a 210-point guy going, hey, 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 hey. and I'm throwing up girls in the air and catching them. Who's got the better job? I'm just saying. I was born at night, but not last night. Somebody's tweeting that. I'm talking about Jesus and stuff. That's the only thing they're going to remember about the sermon. (laughs) But there are things that distort. People make fun of you. I have an an overbite. I do. Serious overbite. When I was a kid, people used to make fun of me. I'm a pastor's kid. My mom's a pastor. My dad's a pastor. My grandparents are pastors. There are absolutely no side effects to that reality. (laughs) I'm okay. <laughs> People made fun of me. I was husky. Anybody know what husky is? Husky. I wasn't obese. I just had generous bones. <laughs> People made fun of me. I have a, a vision problem. I have myopia, and sometimes my eyes get crossed, so when you think I'm looking at you, but I'm actually looking three rows behind you. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at my pain. I appreciate the empathy. <laughs> I mean, seriously, stop laughing. <laughs> and there are things that cause you to weep. But if you want to rebuild other people's lives, sometimes you've got to go to the place of pain. You know what I love about Jesus? And let me tell you, I'm totally head over heels about Jesus. I'm like a total Jesus dude. Is that Jesus wasn't afraid of people's pain. Jesus would go to sepulchers and tombs. Isaiah says that God is a grave robber. 
To be a grave robber, that means you have to have the emotional and spiritual bandwidth to enter into people's pain. You know why much of America and the global north suffers from a spiritual deficit? Because we're afraid to enter into people's pain. You know why? Because it reminds us of our own pain. And pastor, I don't want to go there. The famous psychologist, Brene Brown, says pain is often the result of shame, something you're ashamed of, something you don't tell your own shadow, you don't talk about in prayer, you don't tell your parents, a past tragedy or failure. And so the second thing after empathy, if you want to rebuild Florida, if you want to rebuild California and Puerto Rico and Houston or your own life or your own family, the second thing beyond empathy is to face the fear. You know what the most often repeated phrase in scripture is? Ask me, pastor, what is it? I'm going to go over here where people really want to know. Ask me, pastor, what is it? The most often repeated phrase in scripture is fear not. Or a version of it. Do not be afraid. Fear not. Do not be fearful. It is repeated 365 times. One for every day of the year. You know why? Because God knows our propensity to be afraid. Like I'm afraid of, like when I came here, I didn't see a lot of Latinos and I I got afraid. It's foreign. We're afraid of the unknown. And Nehemiah is going back to Jerusalem. He had been away from a while. He speaks with a little accent because now he speaks Persian with Hebrew. And he's not sure how his folks are going to receive him. It's like me, I'm Puerto Rican. When I'm from Puerto Rico, I'm a gringo when I go to Puerto Rico. And when I come to the United States, I'm a Latino. And I'm like, oh my Lord, what am I? (laughs) Tell you what I am. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Created in the image of God. If I have any worth, it's not because of my academics. It's not how many friends I have or followers I have on social media, what gives me worth is that God loves me whether I succeed or I fail. Whether I'm a straight-A student or the other thing. (laughs) Organic chem for a semester. ¿Tú sabes por qué gente no quiere entrar a tu dolor? Porque el dolor de ellos lo sobrelleva. You know why people won't go into your pain? Because their pain is overwhelming. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Unapologetic. Christians follow the cross. Cross is the place of pain where redemption happens. I used to be a high school teacher. I did a lot of things in my life. I was trying to find myself. I'll let you know when that happens. I taught in a very affluent district, and I taught in a very economically challenged district. I taught in both places. And I saw the same problem. I taught in this very affluent district called Metuchen, New Jersey. And I I taught high school Spanish and World Civ. I was a history and Spanish teacher. And there was a young girl, maybe freshman, sophomore, brilliant as all get out, but her grades were suffering. I didn't get it because she's articulate, she was brilliant, anything we asked her, she knew. And one day when I was driving home, I saw, I mean, she was maybe a freshman or sophomore, I saw her walking with this young man who probably looked, I don't know, 18 or 19. And when I was walking, I saw something that still sends chills up my spine. As I'm driving, I saw this young man slap her. Can I tell you that the flesh wanted to take over? Y'all don't know the phrase flesh? Anybody grew up in church ever hear the word the flesh? Tell your neighbor what it is. Just explain it to him in 30 seconds. The flesh. When you don't want to act Christ-like. That's what it means, the flesh. You just want to slap somebody into Tuesday. And I was thinking, man, I'm a school teacher. He's probably out of high school. So if I beat him up and he's 19, technically it's not a crime. (laughs) Kidding, just kidding. Or am I? (laughs) 
I saw that it broke my heart. For more than a semester, I, I had her in my prayer. I said, Lord, help me somehow to reach her. Obviously, it's a public school. It wasn't a Christian school, so there are, there are legal ramifications to proselytizing. Is what the, what the language of society calls it. Evangelism is what we call it in the church. But somehow she opened up and she told me her story of abandonment and her, and her story of neglect in the house and that's all she knew and that's why she was vulnerable to this kind of disrespect and misogyny and abuse. And for a second I told her, I want you to know there is someone who loves you and that you're important to God. Probably could have cost me my job. Some things are worth the risk. The rest of the semester, we hardly spoke. She came to class. Her, I saw her grades improving. I saw her life changing. At the end of the semester, because I was going to leave that district, she comes up to me and she says to me, Mr. Salguero, or as most Anglos do with my name, Mr. Salguero, When you told me that, I found a friend who goes to church. And that friend walked with me through my pain. I left this, I mean, young man. <laughs> he too is redeemable, by the way. My life changed. All it took is one instant to enter into somebody else's pain. But we're afraid. Afraid to go to God, afraid to confess our sins, our shortcomings, afraid to face our insecurity. Nehemiah went anyway. Listen to me now. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is facing your fear with love. We're all, how many of you are afraid of stuff? There's stuff you're just afraid of. Clowns. Anybody afraid of clowns? I'm not, but I'm just saying, my friend, I have a friend, I'm talking about a friend. <laughs> this guy I know, Gabriel. <laughs> I'm Gabe. <laughs> the only thing the Bible says that cast away fear is love. Love cast away all fear. Let me tell you a little story, true story. I'm a freshman in high school. I didn't join the cheerleader team till I was a junior. I didn't have the confidence in my masculinity as a freshman. And I was getting bullied. I was getting bullied. Because when I was a freshman, I know this is hard for you to believe, but this is a true story. <laughs> I weighed 85 pounds. When I left high school, I had a growth spurt. I, I weighed a little more than 100 pounds. <laughs> Stop laughing at me. <laughs> I was getting bullied every day. And the reason I was getting bullied is because the guy who was bullying me, say it with me, he was strong. He was mean. He was strong. He was mean. Say it with me. He was strong. He was mean. I, was, I only weighed 85 pounds. And he would ask me, now I'm not going to tell you when it was, but it was a long time ago because I'm 14 years old. The reason I gave him the money is because I was afraid. And he would ask me every day, give me a certain amount of money. Let's call it 25 cents so I won't tell you what generation. I was like, I'll give him 25 cents. And my mother, my mother, my beautiful mother, Five foot one Puerto Rican power. She gave me money every day for lunch. And I, she kept saying, man, I'm giving you more money and you're losing more weight. But I wouldn't tell her I was being bullied. And I kept giving him 25 cents, 25 cents, 25 cents. October came. He's like, 50 cents. I said, what? He said, yeah, 50 cents. I said, why? He said, inflation. Nothing worse than an, a bully who studied economics. <laughs> the 
And I gave it to him. Asked me why. Because he was strong. And he was me. And I was 85 pounds. And I kept giving it to him. And I get just giving it to him. And I was dying for Christmas break. Because then I could eat all of the penil and chuleta and arroz con pollo and some tacos. And I just, I just needed the Holy Spirit to minister Christmas dinner to me. I was feeling the Christmas carol that year. God bless us, everyone. <laughs> and my mother was kept asking me, man, why? I said, don't worry about it, Mom. I'm going through stuff. You know, freshman in high school, things, life changes. After Christmas break, I went back to school, and there was the bully. Let's call him Michael. That's not his name, to protect the innocent. And I come back to school, and he's like, a dollar. I said, why? He said, the depreciation of the dollar in Europe. He, obviously, see, he didn't say that. He was in high school. I get, you know why I gave it to him? Because he was, and I was, I was insecure. I was 85 pounds. And I gave it to him. I couldn't face my giant. I was afraid. One day, he followed me home. And he looks at me, and he says to me, now, now you're going to know how old I am, because I was wearing pumas with fat laces. Y'all know nothing about that. With the clickers on the back. Click, click, click. He says to me, Nice shoes. And I was like, oh no. He going to beat me up with my sneakers. But what he didn't know is that I was in front of my house. And I have two older brothers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Pentecostal power is about to come down. And so I got bold. <laughs> I'm like, you want these? Do you want these shoes? <laughs> and I started rolling up my sleeves, all 85 pounds of me, like I was going to do something. He's like, yeah, I want you to take them off. I said, you're going to have to take them off. But I want to tell you that I'm in front of my house. And I have two older brothers, and they're looking out the window. What he didn't know is that my middle brother, who's one year older, weighed 83 pounds. <laughs> and my oldest brother weighed like 80 pounds. <laughs> but he didn't know that, nor, nor did he have to. <laughs> Long story short, the reason I had confidence is because there were two people around me that loved me. Yeah, he was strong. Yeah, he was mean. But love wins. The only way you're going to change society is if love is greater than the fear we have of each other. Than the cruelty we allow towards each other. This is the gospel. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he loved us when there was nothing lovable in us. So Michael, let me just say he never got another cent from me. Because sometimes to change the world, all you have to do is face your fear with the love of God. <coughs> Will you bow your heads with me? Will you open your hearts? Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. 
Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. And sometimes your fear doesn't allow you to see God. You might say, Pastor Gabe, or as the young people in my church call me, PG. My city's burned down. The walls of my emotion. My past haunts me, and I dare not rebuild. I'm here to tell you, my family, my sisters and brothers from the OC. There's nothing that you have gone through that will make God love you more or less. I'm here to tell you that you are stronger than your greatest setback and that a temporary setback is not a permanent failure. That God's grace covers a multitude of sin, a multitude of tragedy, a multitude of hostility, a multitude of shame, a multitude of guilt. I know this for I have lived it. When I was doing my PhD, I went through a very severe depression. I lived in Manhattan. I was doing a PhD at Union, which is part of Columbia University. And I, I cannot mention how dark the night of the soul, St. John of the Cross calls it the dark night of the soul. Martin Luther calls it anfectum, the soul struggle. Every day I would spend hours you listening? Hours with the lights shut off in the dark. No hope, no future, no destiny. And I kept thinking. I lived on the fourth floor in a Manhattan dorm room. I was married at the time for married couples. Still married, by the way. I said, if I jump out of this window, will I die instantly or will I suffer a lot? And in my despair... God found me. And God gave me a hope and a future. I still mess up. I still have fears and insecurities. But somehow the love of God has overwhelmed all those things in my life. And he's been begun to rebuild the Jerusalem in me. The walls of my city. Hermana, hermano, Adelphoi, sisters and brothers. Even if the wall of your city is desolate, destroyed, burned, God is a God of multiple opportunities. And today, I want to preach to you a gospel of hope. I am a prisoner of hope with your head bows and your heart open. I ask the Holy Spirit to minister to each of us this evening, to heal every broken place, to comfort every wounded heart, to give beauty for ashes and strength for fear. I ask the Holy Spirit who knows us better than we know ourselves and love us beyond all understanding that he would come to your city the city of your heart and rebuild you so you could rebuild others and I ask that same Holy Spirit that as he heals you and makes you a wounded healer he expands the bandwidth of your heart to be generous to be merciful to be gracious, to be healing. Because what the world needs now more than anything is empathetic healers who have received grace, know grace, and give grace. This is my prayer for you, Nehemiah. May you live to that moment. Amen. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.